This is it coming in on the top. Today on the show, we have Phil Marcade, singer, harmonica player, and drummer of the band The Senders. If you don't know, The Senders were a rock and roll staple out of New York from 1977 to 2001. And now Left for Dead Records is putting out a definitive collection of their works, stemming from demos, recordings, um, stuff that's already been out that's now hard to find, live performances, some rare performances, and uh, it's a banging record. It's a banging record. There's a lot, like, when you listen to this, this collection, you get the sense of how much energy this band had and how fun it would be to see them live. And that's hard to get on a record. Um, I talk with Phil over Zoom, and uh, I don't, I don't like Zoom. Zoom's the worst. So, uh, <laughs> but it's also the best, and I know in 2020, I was using Zoom a lot. But in this case, it cut me out, so our conversation was kind of a little short. But uh, Phil get, gets into some crazy cool stories. So if you're a fan of of, of Wayne Kramer or uh, Johnny Thunders, uh, there's some or Screaming Jay Hawkins. He's got some crazy stories he gets into with those rock legends. One of which involving spaghetti, um, and who knew, right? Spaghetti would be that prominent for some of these punk rockers. Anywho. We're going to listen to a track off the new collection. This is The Devil Shooting Dice off All Killer, No Filler, The Senders. The Senders, the collection All Killer, No Filler, Devil Shooting Dice. First track off it, and you guys get it, right? You get that sense of that energy. Anywho, you can get it off Left 4 Dead Records, the website, leftfordead.com, uh, leftfordeadrecords.com. Um, the new collection comes with a really cool set of bonus tracks. On the end of the first one, there's a cut with Wayne Kramer. And then on the end of the second one is a whole set with Johnny Thunders. And we talk about that performance a little bit in this interview coming up. Um, so before we get to that, if you guys can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on one of the podcast platforms, it helps me keep talking to cool guests and sharing their insights with you. So without further ado, this is my chat with Phil. Thank you. Sure. Um, but let's let's jump into it, man. Um, when when did uh, music for you, like when did you start singing, or did you start with harmonica? Like when was music around? No, the actually, no. I started with drums. Yeah, when I was a teenager. Yeah, and uh, when the Sanders began, I was the drummer. But um, everybody felt there was no frontman. Really, we needed a frontman, and I was singing a few songs. Uh, sitting at the drums, playing drums. And they thought I had the best voice in the band, so I got kind of fired as a drummer and rehired the same day as a singer. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a big jump to go from the back of the band to the front of the band. You know, that's a big shift. Yeah, especially since I had no plan whatsoever to sing. I never tried before, and I loved it, and I ended up doing it for 25 years. And Yeah, but it wasn't planned at all. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, sometimes that's, you know, that's just the th when the, there's no kind of like, like when you really think about like, I want to do this and really learn all this stuff. Sometimes you put a lot of focus on it and then like it becomes almost too much. So when you're just thrown out there and doing it and feeling it and having fun, it just works. It just clicks. Was that so kind of true? Is that kind of how it went? Yeah. Totally. Uh, yeah. And I really agree with that. Um, I think that. Making no, if if I thought of it too much, I probably would have fucked it up somehow. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> it just happened, and um, yeah, it was uh, it wasn't planned at all. <laughs> nice. So, like at this before the senders were together, were you hanging out with other guys? Was the band kind of a? Let's kind of get the history of the band. Like, so music really happened with the senders, right? Like you were hanging out. Yeah. With, okay. So for you, what happened is I was a good friend of uh, Johnny Thunders, okay. who was one of the New York girls. Right. And uh, when he had his new band, the Heartbreakers, uh, I worked as a roadie for them. Oh, really? And this was uh, 1975. I grew up in Paris, in France, and I came to the States uh, in 1972 when I was 17 for the summer holiday. Turn out I stayed for 40 years. And uh, that was like being a singer. That wasn't planned at all. But anyway, I was working uh, in 75. I was working for the Heartbreakers. And Johnny Thunders introduced me to a good friend of his. 
and his name is Steve Shevlin, and he was a bass player. And uh, we started the band together, Steve and I. That's how it, it started. Oh, okay. So how'd you meet Johnny? Well, it's funny. I went to see the New York Dolls. I was in Boston at the time in 74. And I went to see the Dolls because I heard they were great. You know, I've never seen them before. And they invited a whole bunch of kids to the hotel later on. And we ended up playing dice in the hotel corridor with Johnny Thunders. And uh, one of my roommates was really into Italian sauce, tomato sauce, and spaghetti. And they had this very funny conversation with Johnny about spaghetti. And uh, next thing we knew, we invited him over to have spaghetti. And the New York Dolls were coming back to Boston like a week later. So he did. He came over and I had a spaghetti. And uh, so we became good friends. And it was really funny the way it happened. That's amazing. <laughs> well, when, when, you, when you play and there's not much food to go around, spaghetti's a good filling meal and it's delicious. <laughs> well, I tell you, I never thought I would meet a, a rock and roller through spaghetti. <laughs> That's the only right thing. <laughs> Maybe drugs or something, but yeah. spaghetti is not usually the <laughs> the common <laughs> the common thing. But hey, it happened, and uh, he loved the spaghetti, and we became great friends. <laughs> and he's like, "You got to be the roadie now." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh wow. Well, that's what a what a jump from a like an experience going from like. Uh, like hanging just kind of meeting and passing and then being behind the scenes with everything and a, a roadie gig's a rough gig you know like loading everything in and just kind Especially of for the hot breakers right <laughs> right right because of all the all the madness that that followed but, yeah it was non-stop <laughs> yeah um so what was that like aside from like manic? What was that experience like being a a, a roadie for the Heartbreakers? Like, did that? Come well, the nice, the nice part about it was that they had a big loft on Grand Street in Manhattan, and uh, at the time I was looking for a place to live, and they let me stay there. So that became oh, okay. my, my my place. Yeah, and uh, they came to rehearse about maybe once or twice a week, and. The rest of the time, I had a free place to leave, so that was great. <laughs> Is that when you like started hitting the kit a little bit? Yeah, I uh, I played when I was a teenager in France, and I started when I was around fifteen. But um, indeed, there was the big drum kit from the New York Dolls, the big pink yeah. drum kit. Yeah, and so I I got back into drumming. Uh, all day long in that in that space since the drums were there <laughs> and have the time to do it too like because you have to wait to the gig exactly. or wait to the hustle <laughs> exactly I had nothing to do all day but play drums <laughs> that's awesome well like um so kind of the experience from what was the music like like growing up in paris like moving to new york was it completely different was like the art scene? yeah yeah How so? well yeah in, uh, in Paris, you know, I'd been into the normal British band, you know, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, the Kinks, then the Yardbirds. I love all that so much. But it was in 74, when I was already in the States, in Boston, that I came across this whole pile of old 45s of American rhythm and blues from the late 60s, I mean, the late 50s, early 60s. That became my passion, just, you know, everything, American rock and roll, rhythm and blues and rockabilly and all that stuff. And, yeah, I just couldn't get enough of it. And it still is. And um, so I, I got really into that around 74. Got it. So, like, well, I mean, with it's it's infectious. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> those those old rock tunes and, like, to kind of like be in it too, to jump in and be in in the mix of a rock band in a way that's completely like uh, the Heartbreakers were a wild, wild group of people. Um, from from what I've read, now you could probably tell me different. <laughs> being in it, um, maybe it wasn't as crazy as the as the legends make it sound. Maybe it was more more crazy or more more uh, uh, controlled. It was more crazy. Yeah, more crazy <laughs> okay. than what I heard. Or read anywhere. Yeah. And it was 
so much drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> Do you mind if I smoke? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, not at all. Um, but, uh, so okay. So then, as as you're hanging out and and roadieing for the the Heartbreakers, you start playing drums. You meet up with the bass player. And when does like the senders become like a goal to like? When does the group kind of gel to the point where it's like we can play a gig? Well, it took. About six months of rehearsal. Yeah. We had a first guitar player who was from Mexico. And uh, his name was Jorge. We played with him for about uh, six months. Then he quit and went back to Mexico. So we had no guitar player. So Johnny Thunders, who we just talked about, um, asked if we were interested to do a series of gigs with him as a guitar player. Hmm. But not a permanent thing. Just right just for fun to make some money. So we did five gigs together and we kept our eye open for a replacement guitar player. And during those gigs, this guy, Wild Bill Thompson, came to the gig and we met him and he wanted to jam with us. So we invited him to our rehearsal space. We completely blew our mind. The guy was just so great. So he joined the band and he stayed until the very end in 2001. And, um, uh, while Bill took the, the band to a different level, he really was that good. So then we kind of took off, you know, it was 78. So uh, on the, in this collection that's coming out, the bonus tracks on the second disc are all these tracks with uh, Johnny Thunders. Was that from those run of shows? Exactly. Yes, it's from August uh, 78 in Maxis. And uh, on the records, there are, there's are all set. With Johnny, um, it was wild yeah. playing with him. It was so much fun, and uh, we were very lucky because he was in he was in good spirit and in good shape. You know, he was going out and in and out of being in good shape. But at that time, he was, and uh, even better, we could have done any rock and roll cover of Chuck Berry or whatever we, made it easy for everybody, but he insisted on just doing our songs and their songs. Right. So we were send their stuff. So it was terrific. We had so much fun. We did five gigs together, three at Max's and uh, two at a club called Horaz. And uh, it was a blast. It sounds like it. Well, going through, like, when I get these advances, I listen to everything without reading or looking into who I'm listening to just to get, like, a, a blank... Uh, what is this? And like going through uh, both discs, it's like this is a fun band. There's this energy that is carried through, and like I think I think that's what it would have been like seen. And then at the very end, you know, capsule with capping it with these like bonus tracks with the, the set with Johnny Th Thunders. You know, I was like, that how do they know this guy? Like that's crazy. Like in in that being live recording, you can really kind of get that energy. And like I'm glad I'm glad you got Johnny when he was on a on a good end because there's a lot of recordings where he wasn't as much. So and it's cool that he did yeah, you guys' yeah. tunes. That's like so cool. That was lucky. Yeah. But yes, thank you for the kind words. And uh yes, we were we tried to be a fun band, a bar band. We um we never really shop around for a you know a big deal with the major record company we're much more interested in playing bars all the time and uh, so we did that for 25 years and um i guess you could say we're uh, we're totally a bar band we're uh, <laughs> we probably would be terrible in the stadium but in the bar we were, that was our yeah, our thing. <laughs> well, you know, it's hard to work the bar rooms you know what i mean because you get you people are there for the bar, for the most part, you know what I mean? They're not, and they're, you're there as a bonus. You're like, oh, cool, there's a band, you know? <laughs> like, and then you're, you, so you're, you're, you don't have a target person you're, you're trying to entertain. You're entertaining this vast group of people. So your skill set has to be like, you have to bring that energy to get them absorbed into it. Because, you know exactly. I mean? So it's harder. Yeah, totally. It's, we, we started many shows with, Hardly anybody knowing us in the audience and just everybody talking and having drinks. And by the fifth song, they'd be totally into it watching the band. But 
we, we made a lot of efforts for that to work. And <laughs> we did things like, for example, we brought bags of uh, streamers, you know, the throw yeah, yeah. of paper in parade, and we threw that to the audience to throw back at us. That kind of stuff, you know, if you give your audience stuff to throw at you, they, they will be glad to. And um, it's better not to give them bricks, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or shoes. But streamers were great. And uh, so everybody would get involved and have fun. And so we were very prepared for uh, the bar audience. That's well. It, that's that's important. It's important to be able to get them in like that. And I, I like how it was streamers as opposed to giving them, I don't know, peanuts or something that will hurt. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 that engaging, but also letting the bar room. Because I play a lot of like acoustic gigs and bars, and like you can like reach out to a crowd and like. But you also got to give them that. You want to get them in, but you got to give them their space, and it's it's a difficult balance. And like for those first five songs, you know, you're, you feel like you're just like, what am I doing here? <laughs> Where's this going? <laughs> like, It can be. And there's always one or two guys in the audience that are harder than the rest. We had fun with that by doing one. Every show we did this one song called Crazy Day, yeah. where the old guy lay down on, on the floor, <laughs> on the stage. And we asked the entire audience to lay down on the floor too. And then if two or three people would not do it and not lay down. We refused to stop the song until everybody laid down. <laughs> so the rest of the audience would give a lot of pressure to the three or two or three guys that didn't want to lay down until they did. So then come on, they, they've been playing this song for like half an hour, you know, lay down already. <laughs> We're tired of it. <laughs> but it's stuff like that that makes it fun. And the fact that as a group, you guys can do that and make it fun. More people are, that's, that comes off on the record. Like that, that fun energy. And <laughs> that's awesome. I'm glad you heard, I'm glad that you say it comes out on the record. That's quite a compliment. Thank you. Well, that's, that's the first thing when I, when I popped it in, I like, these guys sound fun and I'm getting Holland Wolf vibes. And like, like, and I think that was with your vocals and just how the guitar, the the riffage that was going on with the guitar. Then I didn't know you were doing the harmonica, but the harmonica work was tight as well. Like, when did that? When did you pick up the harmonica? Uh, when we started the band. When yeah. I started not playing okay. the drums anymore, I tried. I couldn't play at all, but I listened to Little Walter records and tried to uh, mimic what he was doing and. After many gigs, I got a bit better, and um, I love playing the harmonica. Yeah, it's a great instrument. It <laughs> is, and as far as like singing, it's an easy one to have. It's right there. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so and it's, it, it's like much less to carry than the drums. You know, it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, especially like in New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now you know. I don't. I wonder if this was this a thing then, like. Um, now a lot of venues will have like a backlined drum kit and some backlined amps and stuff. Was that kind of the case or no? No, not in the seventies. Okay. Just the PA, the mics, every everything else, the drums, the amps, everything. We had to bring our stuff. But you're right. In the in the late eighties, in the nineties, more and more clubs would have a, a backup, a backline, which every band used. And uh, like the drums, the amps and stuff. And um, actually our very last gig in 2001 was at a club called Manitobas in, uh, and they had the PA. And then it was the first time we would charge for the PA. Huh. We had to, not only the club would not pay the bands anymore, we thought that kind of sucks, but now they were asking us money yeah. to play there. We that really sucks. That's when we started thinking of that, you know, we, we'll quit. <laughs> well, we had been 20, we had been playing for 25 years. We're all getting a bit deaf. That was a good <laughs> yeah. time. <to> up. <laughs> <laughs> did you really, did it, was it really affecting hearing? Well, our best player became completely deaf. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the doctor, he, he lost, a lot of hearing, and the doctor told him 
he was going to be deaf completely mm. within one year. So he should learn signing, you know, sign language. Yeah. And so indeed, and there was nothing that could be done, even if he stayed away from noise and stuff. And um, indeed, about a year later, he was completely deaf. And he spent the next 20 years teaching children out of deaf children out of stuff with your hand. Yeah. Yeah. And then and around uh, a few years ago, a true miracle happened. That I'm talking about Steve Shevlin, the guy I started the band with. He called me on the phone saying, hi, it's Steve. And I'm like, well, you can't hear me. So <laughs> it's on your computer. Like, uh, you have a thing. He said, no, I can hear you. I just had surgery. And they put this thing in my ear, like this state-of-the-art little thing that's plugged into my brain. And after 20 years of total silence, I can hear again. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> that's what I said. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd, it'd be interesting, like, um, so one, that's what a, like, what a horrible thing. And then to find this cool, like, way to give back with that. What a cool story to be able to teach and, like, and, like, fully immerse yourself in the in the deaf culture because like it's 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 amazing like i took a couple sign languages courses and it's a it's a tricky language but it's very expressive and the, the culture that surrounds it is very fascinating very like welcoming in within that um but it'd be interesting i wonder did he ever play bass while he couldn't hear because the low vibrations might you know he might feel it in a different no. way Okay. When he was just losing it, yeah. we did a few shows where he told us, whatever you do, don't change the arrangement. Don't, don't change anything because I can't hear you. So just follow me. And like you say, he could just hear the very low vibration of the bass. But that only lasted a few months and he couldn't hear nothing at all. He put the bass back in his box and didn't, you know, didn't use it for 20 years. But uh, we did play a gig together in 2017 yeah and for him it was magic to be on stage again and play the bass and yeah oh it's amazing <laughs> was it like so was it like a cochlear implant the thing that yes in? okay okay wow yeah. okay and like when he played music like was it easy for him or was it was it more challenging because that, that makes everything sound different <laughs> In the beginning, he told me it was very weird. Everything sounded like Donald Duck, but his brain got used to it. And after a few months, it became normal. And uh, he got so used to it that he, he could hear everything completely normally. And, um, wow. you know, like uh, regular ears. <laughs> that's incredible. So that's, that's yeah. initially what stopped the senders was, was that? No, not no. really, because he became deaf completely in 83. Oh, wow. We stopped for a little while and then we got a replacement and went on playing. And uh, he only got, and we played till 2001 with another bass player. And uh, he got his hearing back in 2010, I think around there. And uh, I went back to New York in 2017 to, I had moved out already because I, I had written a book and uh, for the launch of the book, we did a show. So that's when I played with Steve and um, What's the book? And you would back in the place. That's awesome. That's awesome. What's the book? I didn't know there was a book. I would have done double yes, research. Yes, the book, is, <laughs> the book is funny and it's called uh, Punk Avenue. And it's kind of like uh, my story of the first, my first 10 years in the States from 72 to 82. And uh, it's a really funny book. It's just meant to be funny. And uh, so there's a lot of funny stories. And it's on uh, the publisher's Three Room Press. Okay. And it's called Punk Avenue. Nice. So I'm definitely going to dive into that. Damn. That would have been awesome. Please do. Um, so uh, did you, uh, uh, on the side question, did you ever uh, go to the squat theater? No. That doesn't ring a bell. I don't know this play. 23rd Street. Just quit theater, no. Okay, okay. We never played there. Uh, did that come after 2001, maybe? No, no, that was before. That was like... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I but, knew a few squats. Okay. You know, around what you be and stuff, but there was no shows there. There were just a bunch of homeless punk rockers. <laughs> <laughs> Squatting, doing the thing. Um, Squatting, <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> when you when the Sunders got their first like residential like gig, that was on Eighth Street, right? With a, a um, yeah, the Continental. The no. Continental Divide. Yeah. Okay. So that was the best thing we ever did. Yeah. We uh we looked for a place near St. Mark's, cool location, where to do a, a residency to play every week. That was uh, 1988. And uh, within, we were going to do it for like two months. We ended up doing it for over two years. Within like uh, three months of it, we were more popular than ever. That was the best time for the senders. But we really put a lot of attention to it, like who would be the opening band, the records that play between bands. We organized the whole thing, and we called it the sender thing. And uh, that became very popular. It was a big success. Well, you, you know, if you put that time into everything and you really ad- develop the show, you know, people pick up on that. And, like, with you guys being as fun as you are and with all the energy, like, to kind of bring it, uh, to plan each aspect of it out, that's going to make it a successful event. It feels like, yeah. you know, like a lot of... A lot and of- we thought it was very important the band that opened up we didn't want it to be just a Sanders show, but more of a scene. Right. So we, we took a lot of time going to see new bands. And if we love them, we thought, shit, man, they got to play with us. And uh, for example, there was this old blues man playing blues in, in the subway. And I booked him to play in the, this residency, the Sanders the Sander thing. Yeah. And so people really love that, that the opening act, was already was already something special. It was never just any band that the club had booked that had nothing to do with us. So the whole thing was a package that was kind of nice. Oh, that's cool. Who is a who is some of a, like a reoccurring opening act during that time that you guys would like partner? The Willies. The what? The Willies. Okay, Willies. Gotcha. They, they were great. Yeah, and they played with us so many times. Also, the Waldos. That was Walt Oler's band after the Heartbreakers. Oh, there were many, the Gas Hands, the, uh, the Runch Hands, which were fabulous. Um, all those groups that were happening in New York around the late 80s, you know, that we thought were great, you know. That's awesome. Well, and I, I told it like, it's, we're, you're in it together. If you want to make a thing happen, you include other people. And it's more fun to do that. It's more fun to bring other yes. people and not just be like celebrating. Exactly. Um, so, but, you know, we thought each, each of those bands have their own fans. So they will bring their fans each week and then they'll see us and then right. they'll be our fans. Yeah. So it kept growing and growing and it, it worked very well. One thing I wanted to ask was during that time, also uh, kind of a Cleveland based artist, Screaming Jay Hawkins was sharing a residency there, right? Yes, he was playing before us yeah. doing a residency there when the club was called Jack the River. Yeah. And um, oh, I'll tell you very quickly a very funny story about Screaming Jay. We met him once yeah. and he was completely drunk. <laughs> and he, had, he was sitting alone at the bar. And I asked him for an autograph. And he had a attache case next to him that was open and a whole bunch of paper stuck out of it and it was flash paper. You yeah. know what that is? He used it on stage to make a flame with a little yeah. piece of paper. By accident, because he was very drunk, his cigarette, he had a lit cigarette in his hand, yeah. touched the bag and it blew up. He threw us away about, I ended up on the floor with no eyelashes or no eyebrows, <laughs> they were completely burned. Screaming Jay was on the other side on the floor. Hey, it was a pretty big explosion. The flame went all the way to the ceiling. And uh, the funniest part is once he got up, he was totally shocked and stuff. He looked at me and he said, quote unquote, I got you good, didn't I? <laughs> so that was my. Screaming Jay story. <laughs> he autographed your face with fire. <laughs> yeah. Oh man! Wow, that's that's. I don't want to say that's cool because that's pretty terrifying. But what a cool story! It was funny. I'm such a big fan of his. You know, I, I think he was so great, and it was a thrill to meet him, even if it didn't explode in my face. Right. 
Yeah, Scream Again was great. Was it um another another thing I wanted to bring up uh on the on the end of the first part of this uh collection is you guys do a track with Wayne Kramer. And I know Wayne was doing stuff with Johnny Thunders at the time and they were both kind of out of it. They had that band. Um how'd you guys meet Wayne in like was he kind of involved well, in the playing? Yeah. They had that band called Gang War. Yeah. I was their first drummer. Oh, no way. They, okay. Yeah. They called me up from Detroit. Well, Ann Arbor. And told us they were starting this band. Actually, Johnny Thunder called me. And I'm like, wow, this is great. You know, and they said, do you want to play the drums with us? Said, yeah, man. So they flew me over and we did a bunch of demo tapes. Then they asked me if I wanted to join the band forever, but I was right in the middle of the Sanders and I love the Sanders. So I turned it down, they got another drummer. So that's when I met Wayne Kramer. He's a great guy. I, I love Wayne. He's really, really a nice guy. And super, super great rock and roll. And uh, yeah, so there's, there's a track. It was actually in 2001, the last, one of our last gigs, he played, he came on stage to play with us. We did MT Heart by uh, the Rolling Stones, which MC5 already did, so he was familiar with that song. That was great, yeah. I know that track rips. I'm, I got to that part going through the advance. I'm like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> like, that's so cool. And like, so going into the uh, drumming for them, were you still kind of keeping up your drum tops, or was this like a reason to get back on the kit? Yeah, I had a drum in a few years. That was in, what, 78, 79, 79, I think. So, yeah, I had a drum in a while. But um, it stays with you forever. It's kind of like riding a bicycle, you know. Yeah. You just sit at the drum. And uh, I'm not a very good drummer. I'm just basic, you know. It was, yeah, it was great. But, but um, I couldn't believe it that there I was in the room recording with Johnny Thunders and Wayne Kramer. Yeah. Was it, <laughs> it was so, a and a half. With that, with that process, tracking with them, was it similar to like just playing live? What was that like? Were you guys like, did they have everything written out? Like, did you just play the tunes a bunch? Exactly. We played live in the studio. Some of Jenny's new song, some covers. Um, yeah, it was all live all together in the studio, yeah. But I never played on stage with them, which I regret. Because well, many people told me I was nuts to turn down that gig, but uh, I was so into the senders, I didn't want to, you know, leave them. But um, that would have been fun like, with Gang War uh, on tour and stuff. Well, I think that that speaks highly of your your character because those are that's your thing. That was your band. You know, those are the, the guys that depend on you every week. You know, like it's cool that like like I've heard a because I, I was getting ready to talk with Wayne. I was setting something up and then it fell through. But diving into that part of like his story and, and Johnny Thunder's story was a kind of wild time. <laughs> like so, like that. I think that this speaks highly of you and how you cared for your people and making that scene. And that's what that's what this record captures is that magic. Thank you very much. <laughs> like, when did so with the recording of of these this collection of tunes was can we can you dive into that that process a little bit? When was like stuff? When did you guys record? It was at Max's, right? That we take the live show with Johnny at Max's. Right. Then there is stuff that there's 25 years of demos and stuff, and we pick from a lot of songs. Uh, from many different years, and uh, came up with a list of twenty-seven songs we thought were the best. And like, well, so okay, so the most of these recordings are from demos, and then you guys went through. Okay, okay, I wasn't sure if it was all like demos, and uh, some of them were already released in other records in the past. Okay, and um, yeah, so it's like a compilation of stuff that was done in all different years. Gotcha. And going through it and kind of picking like what you guys thought resonated the best as far as like encapsulating that time. Cause that's, that's a, that's a big gap of time to like stay with a group of people and stay focused and like still be inspired to do the gig and show up to the bar, you know, and put on the act and do well, the we, thing. Like we got on so good. We had so much fun doing it. Plus we made a living. So yeah, we went on forever as, as long as the, 
place was crowded, you know, we'd book another one, you know. So. Yeah. But like <laughs> the going through picking out these songs, did you guys find that process as a group was easy? Did you find that you all kind of went to the same like couple tunes or was it a little more tedious going through and digging through these demos? No, it was uh, I already kind of had an idea which one was the best and which one uh, and um, which one had gotten the best reaction from our audience. And so that helped picking up, you know, the songs. Uh, oh, okay. So the was, 27 songs were picked. It was like, it was, was it like planning a set then? Exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay. A very long set. A very long <laughs> set. I dig it. Yeah. That's cool. Well, you know, it, it, it hits like that, thinking like it. Because, like, when I was going through everything, I'm like, whoa, I'm in. Song one. I'm like, I'm feeling the, like it, 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 that energy was there. And that that's a really cool way to, like, plan out a record like this very cool it was funny because they're not in although a little bit they're not in complete chr chronological order right they go back and forth in years because we thought this song goes after this one better and we didn't care so much about the year we mixed them up a bit yeah okay. so that they follow each other very well very cool um i guess in one before we lose our time here one final question um, yeah one minute left yeah we got a minute left so if it falls out, I'll call you on the other one just to wrap it up. Um, but like to stick with a group like that and stick with a motive like that, what's like one like kind of fill a bit of philosophy or or like um, trick of the trade to kind of do that what, to, for you? Like, was there like a a nugget of like passion or like um, mindset that you guys all kind of developed the? You know, I'm, I'm, yes, we're all. Every member of the band was in the exact same wavelength, and we had the same, the same kind of sense of humor. And uh, we would have hung out anyway, even if we were not working. So it was a pleasure. And uh, twenty five years went very fast. <laughs> that's be <laughs> that's beautiful, man. Well, thank you so much for uh, for hanging out with me and chatting with me today. Um, Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig at the Gig podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang.